and then write it. There we go. All right. So welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Thought Leader Thursday. Thank you so much for for being here. We're just gonna have a real quick um, treatment and uh, bring us into the room. So I'll go ahead and because I didn't warn anyone about that, I guess I will just go ahead and do it myself. What is that? That's coming out of my computer. Let me find it. Okay. Save money, live better. Click to shop now. Okay. Just give it a try. I'm not seeing it oh, anywhere. Okay. All right. We'll just keep moving forward then. So if we can just, if you will, if you are in the mind, please let your eyes just lightly close and take in a deep breath. And um, let us come into this room, into this present moment right now. And we are just so grateful for this time together, for this new thought and to an organization that we belong to and for gratitude so grateful for our speakers for the learning for the fellowship for being with like minds sharing our stories growing evolving learning we are so grateful and we just give thanks for this time and we know that whatever we came to do to be to hear we have set an intention for that and so we just breathe in and release out, knowing that as we speak it, it is done, exactly as we speak it into the universe. And we are so grateful and we receive it with love and gratitude and so it is. And so we let it be, amen. One other thing I'd like to um, remind you all that I do, we do encourage questions. We have a wonderful speaker today. And when I spoke with her a couple of days ago, yesterday as well, um, she has a, a lot of information and I'm, she's open to answering whatever questions you have. So uh, John will take care of looking in the uh, chat to make sure um, that he answers any questions that are there, as well as if you raise your hand, he will let us know so we can get some your questions or comments, not just questions, but comments answered as well. We will put some information about our um, speaker in the chat. Um, so so if you want to know how to get in touch with her or, or get on her uh, newsletter, that information will be available to you before, this, uh, before our, our time is up today. So let me go ahead and talk about what our topic today is leaders who last leaders who last and the question is 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 it even possible to sustain leadership how possible is that and when i talked with margaret she said managing ourselves is the heart of what it takes to sustain leadership our speaker today is margaret markison she speaks and writes on church leadership and works with leaders around the u.s and canada as a consultant and as a coach she has taught, she has coached, she has consulted with ministers from 17 different denominations. She is well qualified to speak with us today. She is the author of Leaders Who Last, Sustaining Yourself and Your Ministry and Money. And Your Ministry, Balance the Books While Keeping Your Balance. I may have mixed those titles up, uh, so you may want to straighten that up when I get through here. But Mark Britt offers a way for church leaders to bring their best to their ministry without giving it all away. And we know that sometimes we just give so much. And, and so she's wants to talk about how we are able to give our best without giving it all away so that we have a greater impact and we find more satisfaction with what we do. So Margaret, let's get to the first question that was in chapter one of your book, um, Leaders Who Last, is lasting leadership even possible? Well, I believe it is. And I think you all bear testimony to, to the fact that you have uh, carried out ministry in, in a way that has made a difference for folks. Um, I was remembering when, uh, so I was a minister of, of a congregation for 13 years. And on, uh, on about my fourth Easter Sunday, I was standing in the back and, um, uh, uh, there, there was a tap on my shoulder and I looked over and there was a, a member of the executive board who just, who, who just whispered in my ear, you know, I think we're going to have to do something about that cracked toilet. 
that you know there were my Easter balloon, <laughs> but it also sort of catapulted me into into a crisis in my ministry. I thought so if, you know I'm I'm trying so hard to paint a bigger picture for folks, and we're talking about the cracked toilets. <laughs> but I actually learned another way to be in ministry that what didn't feel so much like I was carrying the burden on my shoulders. And I, I did serve that, that church for another nine years. Um, so I want to share with you some, some of what I've learned. I'm still learning, uh, but also walking alongside uh, other, uh, many other ministers who are seeking to learn a way to, to, to make it work over time, especially in times like these. Exactly. It exactly. hasn't gotten any easier. No, I don't think it does. I think it just there's you know just life evolves into whatever it's going to evolve in, and we need to be flexible and figure out how we're going to get through those things or and and and, and thrive not just survive but yeah so i think one of the the, the well there are, there are actually i want to talk about three areas or i have a conversation about three um aspects to sustainable ministry and those are to um to get clear stay connected and keep calm uh, so simple not easy uh, so first of all just to, to get clear both on who you are and what you want and it, get you know getting clear about who you are is uh as a lifelong journey but i think it's, it's important because that is the biggest gift that you bring to your ministry is your very self you know that you offer yourself uh you know each each and every day each and every week so I'm a singer and I, I uh, took voice lessons for, for over 20 years, uh, mostly from the same teacher, Judy. And Judy used to say to me, nobody else has the voice you have. Just open your mouth and let it out. And then she would also say, when you try to sing like someone else, it sounds bad. So sometimes she would just say, just stop it. Just let your voice out. And um, you know, so it's, you know, it's not easy always to let your voice out in ministry, but it's easier than trying to shape, fit yourself into someone else's box to imitate others. And, and, you know, you can find yourself, you know, in the wrong job or under just an, an incredible burden by, by, by trying to, um, to, you know, in a way to pretend. So there are a lot of ways to work on um, knowing yourself, uh, but I think one of the one of the really interesting, maybe underrated ways, is to consider the the the, the story that shaped you to know your own family story more deeply. And again, this can be a lifelong process. Um, but you know, a, a couple of things that I have noticed over the years in, in my own family was, and so when I looked at my family of origin, I noticed that um, people moved geographically. So a lot of ministers move, but you know we moved all the way across the country for me to, to serve this church in Massachusetts that I was talking about, Little White Steeple Church. And I thought, oh, no wonder. My, my, my mother was a pastor's daughter. She knew how to move around and, and to, to adapt and to be hospitable uh, as, as a pastor's daughter. And that was a tremendous gift to me. Uh, both my parents were intensely curious about other people. And that is also a gift that they gave me just to be interested in people. You know, my dad right up almost to the day he died was asking the people who took care of him, how you doing? How's your family? So I couldn't remember what they answered, but he really, on one level, really wanted to know something, something about them. And secondly, it's important not only to know yourself, but to know what you want. And um, you know, in, in, the, in uh, the book Leaders Who Last, I have a chapter called Know Your Purpose. And the way I've been thinking about purpose lately, really, you know, really over the last year or two, is just to dial it back. Now, don't worry so much about life purpose right now, maybe just your purpose for this year, or even just for 90 days. What's your purpose for the next 90 days? Oh, I like that takes the so, weight off. Yeah, it takes the weight off. That's what I found for myself through these crazy times and others as well. Um, so uh, Susan Beaumont has a great book, um, How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going. <laughs> Highly recommend that book. It's, it's fantastic. And, and she, she talks in that book about, uh, she, she talks about um, walking to the end of the beam of light 
cast by the flashlight you're holding in order to cast the beam just a little further to see a little fragment of the, of the, of the way ahead. So I've been doing these 90 day planning sessions uh, for ministers. And I, I, so I did one on Tuesday and one, one of the participants started talking about what's my flashlight purpose? <laughs> you know, what is, where's the light being cast just a little way ahead. You know, for most of us, we can, we can get some clarity to that level, even though we're in this just constantly changing environment uh, with, with COVID and so many other issues. We don't know how, how the future of the church is going to play out through these changing times, but for 90 days, you can say, okay, well, I'm, this is what I'm doing. And, and when you know, you when you have that much clarity, then you can say, okay, well, this is what I'm not doing. For the next 90 days you have more sense of uh, what to say yes to and, and and what to say no to i'm going to ask you a couple of questions if, if i can interject sure um, sure i'm going to go back to the the thing we said how to you know just how do you, you to, to, to be clear and um let your voice out and so one of the issues that i had and i think many ministers have when they first go to be, you know take on a um a, a church or or whatever you're doing with your coaching or doing one-on-ones or whatever is that what happens when the, the people simply want you to be something else they say they want one thing but they're right. constantly urging you to be something else right right and i think that is sort of a, the navigating part so the the second piece stay connected i think fits in here because you got to know it's really important to know your context so being yourself in ministry doesn't mean you get up and say whatever you think <laughs> no okay. right you know you won't last too no. long if you do that <laughs> So it does, it, 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 it requires some, um, I don't know, I guess subtlety, there's not a formula, uh, but I think it's a process of, a of process. being in your own skin, you know, being more comfortable in your own skin while still being aware of what's going on around you. Thank you. Um, that, that was the question. I said I had a couple of questions. I've lost the, the other one, but that was the question that I had. Um, and so the whole thing about knowing about your the 90 day thing, knowing your purpose for 90 days and and shining that flashlight, that is a great idea because um, it, it, it really it really resonates with me in terms of when, when you realize what you want to do, you can also it's very much easier to say no to something because there's there's so many so many ideas coming at you and your congregation has different things and or whoever you're coaching whoever you're dealing with, they have all these ways in which they want to be. And so it's just that is just a, a wonderful tip right there to, to the 90 day thing and for what you do and don't want to do. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Sure. And it may be easier to say no to someone. You can say not now, right? Maybe oh, it's not yes. no forever, but you know, for this, for this quarter, this is really like what that. I'm focusing on no for now. Or, yeah. or, you know, you can do that with a, with a board as well. You know, what, what are we going to be doing for the next, no more than a year yeah. right now, I think, but you can start with 90 days. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so how do we get the clarity we want? You said know your purpose, okay. And what is yeah. what? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I'm I'm a big fan of 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 uh, writing by hand. <laughs> that that there's something about I've heard that there's the, like this connection when you handwriting is a very complex brain activity. Okay. And so you know one of my teachers Dave Ellis uh, suggested that you he he he, he liked using three by five cards. Mm -hmm write down a lot of ideas on three by five cards, or you can write, just make a list. What do I want? What are 20 things that I want right now? What are 20 ideas to, um, of things I could do in the next 90 days? And, um, and, and I just found it, found it surprising what comes out when I sort of let my brain go. And I also think that, you know, that, that it's, a, of course, it's a prayerful process. Even you, you, handwriting itself can be a prayerful process. Yeah. Um, and then you, you know, you can have a thinking partner. It, it could be a coach or a spiritual director, uh, a close colleague to, to give you feedback on what, what they're hearing you saying. I have a spiritual director and, and I, I often come out, he, he, he talks less than I do. And I come out with more clarity about myself at the end of a session than I had going in. Nice. Nice. Um, so we're just we're just talking about clarity and how and how we're staying clear. You said there was three three things that we're doing to uh, sustain our. Oh yes, yes. So the second the second piece is to to stay connected. Okay. So get clear and stay connected. 
So ministry is about relationships, no relationships, no ministry. Uh, you know, and that's sort of the tension with figuring out who you are, standing in that, but also working on cultivating these connections with, with folks um, so that over time people know you and, and trust you. So how do you stay connected? Well, it's been harder. It's been a lot harder over, over these last uh, couple of years. You know, I know that, you know that. It's getting a little bit easier now that, that uh, we can can be together more, but it's it's still challenging. And then, you know, there are people who who haven't come back to church or haven't re-engaged with whatever your ministry is uh, through this time. And so to connect without chasing after people is, um, you know, it, take, it's, it takes some, some discernment. Yes. Uh, but just a, a, a couple of, of ideas that, that I've heard from people that I thought were really creative. Uh, so uh, I, one of my coaching clients is a minister who was about to go on sabbatical and people were getting a little anxious about it. They, they, they'd never had a minister go on sabbatical before. And so he just started texting everybody, each person in the congregation for their birthday. And uh, he you know, just had a, a alert on his phone and every day he would just text whoever's birthday it was. And people absolutely loved it. And the anxiety in the congregation began to settle down and they really were able to send him off uh, in May quite joyfully. Uh, you know, so it's not just about technique. It, you know, it was also uh, just the way he, he was with them through these, through these weeks before he left. But I thought that was, was uh, one uh, creative idea. Mm -hmm. And another idea, well, some years ago, uh, this was pre-pandemic, but I talked with one uh, a minister who told everyone on the board that if they suggested a book to him, that he would read it and get together oh. with them and talk about it. Wow! So I thought that was so brilliant. <laughs> uh, not anything that uh, that I, I would have thought of. And so I, I ran into him about about a year later. He said, "I said, how did it go?" He said, "Oh, it went great. People." People love about two thirds of the board took him up on it, and he said, "I'm going to do it again this year." So that's something that takes you know a fair amount of time to read, you know, uh, six or eight books uh, and, and meet with people. Um, so it you know it'll, it's the ideas are you, you could use your imagination, but it's really not not just about the technique, but just the process of thoughtfully connecting. Exactly. So uh, and then I want to oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? Uh, I, I didn't have a question, I was gonna make a comment, but I'll come back to it. Okay, well, I just wanna say a little bit about who do you connect with? Right. So that's a little bit about how and, but who? So first of all, I wanna say, connect with people who give you energy. Mm -hmm. So the people who suck the energy out of you, they are very good at getting your attention and your time. That's been, been my experience. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, say a little bit later about, talk a little bit later about setting limits with, with some of those folks. But so it's easy to, to, to not neglect, but to, your attention gets sucked away. So you don't spend enough time with those people who are really positive, who want to make things happen. They don't act, demand your attention. They're not so needy. But I think you need them yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to maintain your energy over time. Um, so those folks, and then this, you know, could be overlapping circles. Um, secondly, is like leaders and potential leaders. So if you're if you're in a congregational or some other kind of ministry where you're working with groups of folks, to 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 spend enough time with with leaders and just even have a list. Here are the folks. Here are the board members. Here's the, you know whatever the structure is in in your organization. And have I talked to so and so this month? Yeah. And, and and I think that that phone or in person is, is better than text or email. Text or email is better than not being in touch. Um, I studied with uh, Edwin Rabbi Edwin Friedman, who was uh, wrote uh, Generation to Generation, another book that I that I recommend. Uh, but he said like in between meetings, just sort of keep track. Like, have you been in touch with board members in in between the, the meetings? Even even just a little bit of a touch. It, uh, you know, it was easier when we had coffee hour and you could just, you know, tap somebody on, on the shoulder. Um, and then, um, so then in addition to leaders, potential leaders, and by that I, I would say like, who are, are there people around that have some, you know, are comfortable in their own skin, 
comfortable with, with difference and disagreement without getting too reactive about it and uh, you know, have some flexibility of mind. Yeah. And um, you know, some organizations have more of those people than others, but those, those are the people that I'm looking for right. when, I, when I'm looking for a leader, not just people I like. Uh, you know, that's the temptation. People, not just people who think like you, but people that, that have some, there's, there's some there there. Uh, and then the other, the final who, and this is a little bit of a tough one uh, sometimes, is the people who disagree with you. Mm. It's very easy when, a, when an issue comes up and someone makes noise about it to, to start to avoid them. And I, I, I do think that leaning into those relationships can be really productive and le leaning into them in the way where you're not trying to change their mind, mm. but just to connect with them. You know, I've talked to pastors who had opponents who ended up, they were like avoiding their, 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 these people's pastoral needs, you know, don't do that. <laughs> uh, and you don't have to talk about the issue. It could be baseball, you know, or their grandchildren or whatever, but just to, you're, it's sort of money in the bank in those relationships. Mm -hmm. And you may find, not necessarily, but you may find that over time, something softens in them and uh, you know they may come around or maybe not but you you know you will have done your part in, in maintaining the relationship exactly so if anyone has any comments or any experiences or some of the things yes michelle uh, margaret i love what you're saying this is all so beautiful and powerful um i just remember when you just what you just said there i'm just remembering the movie rbg um yeah the documentary, not the not the movie, but where she talks so much about, and this is you know not a secret of her relationship with Scalia, right. um, and they were absolutely opposite sides of the fence on every issue. They were completely opposite and argued, you know, their points like crazy when they were making decisions, and yet they were the best of friends. That's a great example. And I just, I, I mean, that's not easy to do, Woo, no. that is, but what a great example that is of the ability to do that and the power of doing that. Yes. Yeah, and that requires something on both sides and some people will be less less open to it than, than, the, than, than the two of, of them were. Um, all right, and I, I wanna say so, a little bit about, about connection with people who are, uh, who are more difficult in general, uh, wh whatever their point of view. And um, it's to connect with people who are, are more difficult does not mean you have to spend as much time with them as they want to, or talk with them as long as they wanna talk with you about whatever the issue is. And I think it's, it's a pastoral contribution to set limits with people who have issues with boundaries. And uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it provides a challenge to them and, um, you know, for those of us who feel called to serve, that can feel, you can feel guilty about setting those kind of limits. And, and I, I don't think you need to, that it, it's actually a gift sometimes to say, you know, so far and no further. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about the difficult people is going back to these family of origin questions I mentioned earlier, you know, some of the gifts that I got from, from my parents is the people that, that push our buttons the most there's probably something in our family, or maybe somebody like that person in our family. And you know, I, I know, uh, you know, one of my mother's uh, challenges was she she was very conflict diverse. I've inherited some of that, and so when people are mad at me, that is uh, that requires some work on my part to be able to lean into it and have the conversation. That's been a growing edge for me over the years. So there's some, you know, some personal growth opportunities when somebody just drives you crazy, you know, just step back and say, hmm, maybe Aunt Gladys, you know, and if she's still living, you could give her a call. <laughs> say, how you doing Aunt Gladys? <laughs> and, and sometimes uh, people have found, uh, some of my coaches over the years, that asking that difficult family member for advice about how to deal with a difficult congregant has, has been really a really productive conversation. Oh. Uh, so that, that's been intriguing to me. That's okay. I'm writing that down. It's good information. It's, it's interesting you bring that up because it's, um, it's one of the challenges that I certainly have, and I do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. I love one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
Um, and there's always people who want to talk one on one who don't really want to go anywhere. And so, uh, you know, so just trying to set boundaries with that um, and say, you know, what is the purpose of this conversation and what do we want to gain out of it and how can I help? Um, it's very, it's a, uh, it's a challenge. So, and I feel like, I feel like getting involved in those kinds of conversations helps me grow as well, helps me right. understand, you know, right. how, because, because they deserve, they deserve, you know, my time as, as anybody else does. And so for me to be able to, to meet with these people, whatever, wherever, the, whatever the challenges lie, um, is very growth, growth oriented for me as well. And hopefully helpful for them. I think it is actually just, just even giving them some time. I see your hands, Celeste, I'm definitely gonna call you in just a second. Um, so thank you for, for talking about difficult people because there's, yeah, that's a challenge. And I think Celeste, what did you want to say, honey? Yes. Uh, perhaps many of you have already read the famous essay or heard it uh, by Raymond Charles Barker on how to change other people. <laughs> and the reason I mention it is because I am going to use it as the basis for my talk on August 7th. So sometime after August 7th, you will find it on uh, Facebook Live for uh, the Centers for Spiritual Living Boca Raton, a new updated How to Change Other People. Okay. Uh, spoiler alert, you can't change others. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Well, well th you know, if I could use that as a segue into one of my favorite quotes, uh, um, <laughs> which is from uh, it's Paulina McCullough, who was a, a family therapist in, in Pittsburgh, who, who she wrote. So if the word in real estate is location, 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 the word in relationships is acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Nice, nice. So I, f I have found that helpful. Um, and I also just want to add a little, little corollary, which is acceptance does not mean that you have to put up with everything that other people do. Right, right. Thank you. Well, um, the, the, the other thing that came to me when you were just talking about, um, you know, just dealing with, and this is not a difficult people, just people who don't, who don't necessarily agree with you or whatever gets your hackles up. Um, you know, and, and you, you just think because you're a minister, you shouldn't be getting your hackles up, but that's unrealistic because, uh, you know, they get up. Um, and I was talking with someone and, 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 and saying something I thought was really a clear example of what I was talking about. And then later on, she came back, you know, a couple of weeks later, she goes, so what do you, what did you mean when you said, you know, what I said? And in my mind, I thought, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I thought, no, no, back it away, back up. She, whatever you thought you said, you didn't. So figure out what you want to do here. And I thought, okay, well, what's the different? So then I just, okay, well, thank you for that. And it just, it actually reflects on everything that I do now moving forward. I'm just making sure that what I think I'm saying, I'm actually saying. So, so you know, it's, it's, it's that opportunity to keep continue to grow, even though um, it's not always that lovely to hear. Um, it certainly is an opportunity. And I, I have I, lots, lots of yeah, opportunities. I think that's right. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I want everybody to love everything I do and everything I say, <laughs> right? And think all my ideas are fabulous. You know, well, <laughs> that's uh, that's not realistic. <laughs> it's completely unrealistic. Completely unrealistic. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Steve, uh, Albert, you had your hand up, honey. Yeah. There, there's one technique that we've learned um, that seems to work wonderful for situations where you're bringing up a new idea or dealing with someone who is not receptive as you would like them to be. And that is to present whatever you want as an experiment. Um, you know, we have, I know you're, you're, you're a little hesitant at this point, but let's try an experiment for maybe a week or two and see how that works out. And more people are open to a short term new idea than they are to disrupting their entire life. That's good. It's kind of like that 90 day plan you talked about, Margaret. I like that. Just Yeah, I like I like it, it too. And actually, you know, and I, I, I think part of the trick is to genuinely in our own heart, like my own hearts to think it, this really is an experiment. I really could be wrong. This right. could be not the greatest idea for this 
uh, for this setting and we need to try it out. Yeah. And I yeah. think people, people instinctively know when you're trying to railroad them or when you're mm -hmm. really open. Yes. I, there's definitely something there that just that resonates. They know they know when you're being authentic, and really trying to help. So yeah, I agree. Excellent. So we're talking about um, staying connected, and uh, and being in relationship, and that's the that was this the, your second um, aspects of lasting leadership. Or um, did you want to speak further on that, or did you have the? the yeah, no, I think uh, I think that is what I have to say about that. Uh, and so we can go on and talk about number three. So, which is keeping keep calm, keep, keep, keep calm. Keep last calm. but not <laughs> least, last but maybe the hardest. And maybe keep calm might be a high, too high a bar, <laughs> you know, really realistically calmer. <laughs> calmer. Right, managing your own reactivity somewhat. Um, so my teacher Edwin Friedman used to talk about the non-anxious presence or actually the relatively non-anxious presence. And so one minister said, I don't have to be non-anxious. I just have to be the least anxious person in the room. So in some rooms, that's a low bar, right? You just have to ratchet it down a tiny bit. You know, when something comes up and you just feel that feeling, you know, in your chest or your, you know, you, you feel your heart start to pound, um, you know, if you could just breathe and feel the back of your chair and um you know you you know like just like as we did at the beginning um, of, of this session so there th this does get back to knowing uh to, you know, getting knowing who you are and that is knowing what your your favorite um anxious responses are and you know if you've got the fight flight freeze feed uh what you know whatever you know 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 what yours is so you can know when you're anxious i mean sometimes we're anxious and we don't actually even know it so there's the self-awareness over time to know how you respond so i know you know i i'm not one to fight and uh, you know so in my family again that was like the boys fought the girls didn't so that's kind of how how it worked and uh so i'm more inclined to freeze or uh or or to flee um, I was going through my some some material from my um, family's sort of memorabilia, and I found this list. I'm sure my mother made this list of all the ways that we weren't going to fight, you know, argue anymore. <laughs> so, I thought, yeah, that was mom's handwriting. She wrote that. Um, so, you know, you can know your own. Maybe you are inclined to, to wade in before you think about it. And so, the practice is to to step back. You know, for me, the practice is to step in. And you know to experiment. Um, one of my one of my friends, Elaine Boomer, is a family therapist. Talks about when you know you when you know what your process is, your emotional process, your automatic reactions. Uh, can you do the opposite? And so you're increasing your repertoire. You don't have to just react in your usual anxious way. You can do something uh, a little bit different. Maybe it's not the opposite. Maybe it's just. Uh, you know, and, and answer the anxious email tomorrow instead of right the second before you could even think about it. Interesting. You know, and there are a host of spiritual practices. I'm sure that you are, are well aware of many spiritual practices that can contribute to this over time. You know, whether it's prayer, uh, breathing, meditative walking. Um, and I... Um, you know, I have found that when I feel very unsettled, like even one minute of meditation is exponentially better than no minutes. And just, you know, so if it's a tough time, maybe you just have to dial it back. Here are two or three things I can do, you know, in this crisis. You know, I can call my best friend every day. I can make sure that I have, you know, at least one minute for prayer. I can breathe before I make a phone call, you know, what, whatever it is, make, you know, make your list of, you can make your list of 20 ideas for handling your anxiety at this time, uh, whatever it is. Um, you know, as I talk to folks around, um, you know, around North America now, it's, you know, it's not so much that high level of anxiety generally, it's that people are just tired. Mm. And, um, 
so you know part of part of the work you know when you're when you're tired it's it's harder to stay calm and maybe for you know some people in my 90 day group uh session on last on tuesday they were saying you know just rest but, but this 90 days is about resting so i can take on the fall It's so interesting, um, you know, because you're talking about the, the the family of origin, and it, it's it that story is so much more powerful than than you think it is, or that I certainly don't think a lot about the things that the um, automatic reactions to things. And one of the things that I have a difficult time with is um, is is um, not waiting in. I mean, as soon as something happens, I'm ready to face it. There's and you know, looking at it, it's. For whatever reason, I haven't explored it yet, but courage is a, is a thing for me, just being being courageous. And so I've identified that stepping in and stepping into something and facing it is a part of being courageous. And so so I have to you know face it all the time, all the time, all the, which is tiring. And I'm sure not just for me, but for others who say that I'm you know confronted, which I am. <laughs> So, but this, so this is a good. This is very good for me to be looking at. The other thing you talked about was um, the thing about calling your aunt, someone who's a difficult person, and just talking with them about how they would handle something. That's never occurred to me to use them as a, um, you know, as a, as a as a resource. And it, it, people always, everybody wants to help. So I, I that's a such a, a good suggestion. So thank you so much for everything that you're you're sharing with us today. Um, who, who has, anyone have a comment before we move forward um, or, or questions about what uh, Margaret is sharing with us today? Uh, yes, uh, experiences they have. Celeste, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yes, here I, I was just typing it into the ch chat room so I wouldn't be talking all the time. Uh, Parker Palmer, for those of you that don't know the name, check it out. He has about seven books. He has a center for courage and renewal that's designed for teachers of all kinds, be they medical, public, spiritual. His work is wonderful. Would you go ahead and put that in the in the chat, Ms. Celeste, so we can have that information? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah I can echo that. You, you know is, this one? Yeah, Parker Palmer as a Quaker, a wonderful resource. Yeah, and he... Uh, let your life speak. It's mm. an early book of his. It's... I'm writing these things down. Let your life or your light. Let your life. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, here's another wonderful quote. Uh, some, I don't know if it's in a book or an article. He talked about what he called the functional atheism. So that's a, like people who believe in God, but think it's all up to them, actually. Well, I'm sorry, what does that mean? So that they, that, so they believe in God's work in the world, but they think that they really have to do it all themselves. So, oh. so they're functioning as if they don't believe in God, even though they do. Does that make sense? It does, it does, I got you. Okay, functional ACM, okay. Um, so I was just, I'm just gonna go back and some of the things that you wrote in your book um, on chapter four. This one, Keeping Self Calm uh, was chapter eight, Leaders Lead and Do Not Panic. So I love that, I love your titles. And the, the one in chapter five, though I need some understanding about what does it mean to think in threes, triangles and leadership. Can okay. you speak to that? Yes, I can speak to that. Yeah. So the basic idea, and this, uh, this idea comes out of family systems theory, and the basic idea is that a two-person relationship is inherently unstable. So it gets wobbly. So um, um, you know, you're having, um, well, let, let's just say the church administrator is having a trouble with, you know, some, with a problematic church member okay. and, and brings you in on it. So that might be appropriate. But it calms the administrator down because they brought you in. Um, but the, it can be challenging because then sometimes people avoid talking directly to one another. Ah. So, um, 
So the work is for all of us, I think, is to focus on one-to-one -one relationships and not to take responsibility for other people's relationships with each other. Okay. And, and there's a, a step beyond that, which is I think for congregational leaders, which is that we can be in a triangle with the actual church congregation and that church's future. And so many ministers feel responsible for their church's future. Yes. You know, and so nowadays, when I think the future of congregations is less certain than it's been in the past, it's extremely stressful to bear that burden of the future of your congregation. And it actually is not up to you. So you have a part to play, but there are many factors at work, including the people themselves and, and the responsibility they're willing to take for, for their church. So when I, you know, as a, as a congregational minister, when, when I let go of trying to make something happen for my church and its future, my stress level went down exponentially. Hmm. Say, I, you know, my, my calling is to be with them, to teach and speak to them about, you know, my understanding of, of um, the life of faith and our life together as a congregation. That's my responsibility. What they do with it is up to them. That was really freeing. It's interesting you say that. That is, um, th that is how I, that's how I feel. And and yet, um, just many times I'll, I'll have congregants come to me and say, "Well, what are, what, <laughs> what are you going to do?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yada yada yada. <laughs> Uh, and so, and then, and so I fought back on the well, well, do you have suggestions? Well, what are you willing to do? What, what, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Um, and so I don't get a lot of response back from that. Oh, well, I'll get back to you. Yeah, do that. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, but I think it is a great question to appeal to people's, you know, thoughtful brain Absolutely. in terms of handling some of, of these challenges and to, and to push, kind of push the penny across the table, uh, you know, obviously not completely because yeah. the, the leadership is is really important uh, but it's not everything right so um so speak to that point you said leadership is is important but not everything so tell me what you mean by that so so a leader a, a, yeah a leader occupies a particular position in a group and people are realistically dependent on that position being filled in a thoughtful way. So you've seen, you know, a, an anxious leader can cause everything to spiral out of control, right? We've all seen that happen. So, so a calm, relatively calm, thoughtful, emotionally mature leader makes a big difference, helps the anxiety level to go down just by their presence, not by trying to calm people down. That's a critical role. That's a full-time job in itself. And yet, you know, the best leader on the planet cannot make something happen with nothing. There have to also be mature, thoughtful leaders to come alongside, to work together, to encourage others to take part, you know. So yeah. there's, um, they're just uh, the, the, all these elements really that are required for a successful for a successful organizational life. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, and honestly, I mean, in some congregations, there's not enough there there. You know, and also even when there is, there is also a time to to, to for an honorable closure, and end of a ministry. You know, it, it, there's a, a cycle of life, and it happens with congregations. It's very hard for us to let go at the end of a of a ministry's life. And I, I think that is, is, is really um, an important ministry yeah. that doesn't get enough credit you know, to help that happen. Yeah, okay. So just, I wanted um, to, to ask you because uh, many of our members here at Anton um, do not um, uh, have a, a church home for our church for say have church homes, but yeah. not a church that they're yeah. leading. Um, but do their ministries in different ways. Like Michelle, you have a counseling, coaching that you do, and there's just different people do. So what, so, so what, it, because most of your um, t discussion in your, I think your book seems to be about um, 
people who are who have a congregation what would you speak to as important to people who are leaders but don't necessarily have a congregation so how do they you know take some of this information into what they're doing their coaching uh, or their counseling or their one-on-ones like i do a lot of that i do have a church but i also do a lot of one-on-ones yep. what do you yeah, think good. is important for us to yeah know? good question yeah and i i um so a couple things come to mind so one is you know what you were talking about in terms of like working with people who are motivated mm. and challenging people who are not motivated so if you're working with people one-on-one um Right. You know, you, what's the best use of your life energy? You know, you, you may need clients, you know, you're trying to make a living. That's, that's, a, that's an important factor too. But, you know, if, if you are more, somewhat more challenging to your clients, you may find yourself with better clients. Got it. Uh, so that's, that's one thought. And, and also if you are, you know, if you're part of a, of a, um, of a church community, not as the, as the minister or right. the leader. So you're, you're, but, you know, by virtue of your, you know, ministerial status, you are, you have a, a leadership position, even if you don't have a, an office. Okay. And uh, um, so I think, you know, being, um, thinking about your own connection within that, that congregation, you know, which could help also your own ministry if you do coaching or spiritual direction or whatever you do. Um, to, so every church is fascinating. What it, and to, just see what you can learn by being part of the congregation and then you can bring that into into your ministry so um and i oh one one final thing and that is to continue uh, to reflect on your own family of origin because you you know you bring that into your office with your clients yeah and, and you know the more um aware you are of the forces that have shaped you the more effective you will be in your one-on-ones. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here who would like to share what's um, some of their experiences with uh, Michelle? <laughs> well, I don't know what the rest of your question was going to no, be. It's okay. It doesn't matter. My I had my hand up before you asked. <laughs> well, I was just, Margaret, I was just thinking about um, and everything you've said. I really love this, but about the staying connected in the relationships. And I was a minister of a church for 22 years. Now I'm not, but I, I do other things. And, 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 and like you, I grew up completely um, confrontational averse. I do anything to avoid a conflict, anything. And I think about decisions I made in ministry um, and how I've grown in that, you know, there was a time in ministry where I would let something go, even so far as to, you know, allow someone to step in leadership that I knew was not, mm. was not going to be, was not going to serve. But rather than upset that person, I let them in, which then harmed. I mean, it was, it's all growth. And I do understand that, but who was not necessarily good for the community. I did that more than once um, in reflection. Could have done it differently, but you know, I didn't because I still had that family of origin, such an aversion to conflict. And I just think about how important it is and 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 thank goodness how I've shifted and grown because I teach classes now and I have ongoing classes and I have repeat customers in those classes. And I've had a woman in those classes that is is she's just it's not serving the class to have her. And so about several, several months ago, I sat down with her and I told her you, and she was not happy that mm -hmm. I basically said, you can't be in the class anymore, but I made that decision for the class versus for her. So it's, you know, about relationships, it's about boundaries and it's about doing the hard stuff. And I love what you said when you have a, when you have an automatic reaction What's the opposite? So my automatic reaction is, well, just, you know, let them be in. The opposite is say, no, you, you can't be in this anymore. Yeah. So thank you for re for talking to that. And I just wanted to reinforce that with a couple of examples. All right. Thanks. Those are, <laughs> thank great, you, those are great stories. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's helped me over the years to do I some of the, the hard things is to, to, to think about like what's in everyone's best interest here. Yes. You know, is it me avoiding this conflict or leading into it? Is it me taking responsibility for things I shouldn't be taking responsibility because it's easier? Or is it really insisting that people step up to to their capabilities? Um, you know, that's been true in family life as well as in 
in uh, organizational life. So, Thank you. Celeste? Yes, I just wanted to uh, say to Michelle, I have been in the same boat as you uh, with a student and I met with her after class. I didn't say anything during class, but after the others had left, I met with her after class and said, this is not a good fit for you. You know, this is not the right class for you. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of like, she wasn't wrong, I wasn't wrong, nobody was wrong. It was just, we were not headed toward the same goal. And uh, it's kind of like, I put this in the chat so you don't have to write this down. Uh, sometimes your goal is to, to comfort the upset and sometimes it's to upset the comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you have to balance that out. And if somebody is looking for uh, it, the class to be handling their own personal problems, then you say, no, that's not the purpose of this class. Mm -hmm. And that has to be a private session. I want to throw out a question to all of you, but particularly you, Michelle and Margaret, because you brought this one up. Uh, and clearly, this is a, a, a something that occurs when you when so you have a a person who who's definitely not a fit for something you're doing for a class and they're not really working well with the class and you have that discussion with them and ask them to tell them what you need in the class and can they either do that or you know step away. My question is, how did your the remaining students? how did they feel about that? Because, you know, there's there's this feedback that you get like, oh, how could you, you know, whatever. So I get that a lot, but yeah. Yeah, for, for mine, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so they already know. Yeah. And, and, they thanked, and they thanked me for caring enough about the class to do that hard thing. Okay. Thank you. Now, you know, and, and in the, in other situations, like in my church, I've had to do things like that. And, oh, you know, I had people not, I had to let an employee go and, oh, yeah, yeah. Did I get a lot of uh, pushback? I mean, huge pushback on that. Yes. And yet it was absolutely the thing that had to be done. And so you don't like it. I'm sorry, but it had to be done. And that's leadership. Thank you. You're exactly correct. You're exactly correct. Margaret, what was your, what was your comment on? Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I well, with some people, all you have to do is take a stand with them and they'll quit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't have to ask them to leave. You just have to yes, say that, yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the other thing that you could say something and they don't, they don't take the hint and, and then you just have to finally just say, okay. Right, um, you do. And so we do get that, that um, pushback from others. And, and, and part of what, for me, what I'm thinking is trying to teach what the actual principles are, you know, so, so, so to stand up and to tell the truth and to be authentic is, is what, is what it takes and um, hiding behind, you know, spirituality and not, you know, and, and by not telling someone the truth and not talking about what's really going on in the room, I can't, I, I'm, I'm unable to do that. So, um, so I feel like part of my job, part of our job as leaders is to actually speak the truth, even if it's hard um, and show the way by doing that. And whatever happens, happens and then deal with that next step. But um, that's what happens. So there you go. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, oh, uh, any, anyone else have any other questions? Because I want to, any thoughts? Okay. How are we doing, John? Where are we at? Because I'm going to just. You have six minutes. Okay. Um, do you want to, um, Margaret, say any final words? I'm going to wrap up some some end of the end of the uh, sure thing. Well, I did. I do want to offer you a uh, a checklist for sustainable ministry um, for signing up for my newsletter, which I will put the there's the link in the chat if you would like. It's it's a pretty much email weekly. Um, I'd love to have you join me. And then finally, I just want to leave you with uh, some words from Lao Tzu, one of uh, my favorite, all-time favorite quotes that I come back to again and again, which is this. Do your work, then step back. Mm. The only path to serenity. 
Mm, I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us and for all of your wisdoms. And um, did you put your book, the name of your book in there as well? I didn't, but I will. Okay, thank you. Please here. do that. Okay. Thank you so much. I got it and it's just lovely. I love it. I, I love the book. Um, I do want to let you guys know what's coming up um, for us. So the the, the next speaker for, uh, well, we're in July. I'm always getting my month speak. I think it's August, right? We're coming up with August. Yeah. The next speaker for August is uh, Reverend Robert Brzezinski. And some of you may know him. He is making quite a name for himself um, with his New Thought Media. Uh, hi, Martha. Good to see you. With his New Thought Media um, work. So he uh, is going to be, he's going to be with us. Where's Robert? Where's Bill? He's going to be with us at our conference, Bill. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, New Thought Media Network is going to be the, um, the, the, the the online host for the virtual part of the conference or the retreat. It's actually a retreat this year at Unity Village. It's going to be spectacular to be in person. You can still register. Early bird deadline has been extended until the middle of August, so you can get your name on the list now. And virtual is also uh, available so that you can participate hybridly. And New Thought Media Network is uh, is, is making that happen. Great. So he's just been, he was at our INTA conference that we just had, and um, he and so if you just go to his uh, site, um, it, he'll be here next next month to talk about what he's doing and his in the future of that and why he thinks um, new the new thought media is important to new thought itself. Um, so we look forward to having him here. Um, I'd like for uh, for for Angie to talk just a little bit about this conference that we were just at. Um, I wasn't able to be there, but I was there virtually. The INTA World Congress and and what that's doing for us, the importance of that for us, uh, and, and and New Thought. Angela, can you speak to that for just a moment? No problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the important thing, and I I stressed that uh, when I closed uh, after receiving the award that uh, we're all um, getting the word out as to who we are. My feeling is that we as practitioners, ministers, uh, the greatest healing energy we know is love, but the other greatest healing answer is remembering who we are. And so I want to stress that uh, everyone in that, uh, there are like nine or 10 New Thought organizations that they all deserve the legacy award because they're out there enhancing lives. And dealing with the idea that we forget, we get overwhelmed with this negative stuff. And I did tell us a couple of stories uh, involving a, a, a very dear friend of mine who was a medical doctor who had terminal cancer. And he had uh, put himself in the hospice, he was gonna die. But I stress that we are very powerful individuals, but the idea of the universe, uh, I've spent 90 years being educated by the Jesuits, so I love Latin. We had to do everything in Latin. But I said, the universe, what does that mean? It means the one verse. That's that we are each uh, playing our note on the song of the universe. Mm -hmm. And how we play our note affects the entire song. We're very powerful people. And so being part of that means that we're not just absorbers and uh, we get information, but we're participants. So whatever we do affects the entire universe. So the bottom line is everyone here, everybody on this uh, on, on this. Uh, zoom meeting you're all doing this you're playing your note well getting people to know what new thoughts all about and the bottom line is uh, we call it the cosmic awareness it's the the highest level of awareness which is um, understanding who we are that we are love energy and it's a place of conscious where only joy exists there's no doubt or fear or anything and that's what we're all doing but we have to be the message and every one of you folks, and, and myself included, as I get older, I'm, I'm realizing I can continue to do that. I need to be the message in all that I do, realizing that we are internal incarnated life forms of God itself, experiencing its creations in the physical as each of us. That's pretty powerful. And then the second thing is that we, have, we are that spiritual entity that is superior to everything and anything that's happening to us. So we need to get the word out of who are we and what are we? 
and, and make that our message is to be the message in all that we do. Anyway, that's my speech to you. I'm sorry. I'm talking <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's one of the, we wanted, I mean, the INTA conference was really great for getting that message out. And I was glad that we, as Anton was on that stage, you were there talking about what we do, Emerson, uh, Anton, Bill, a lot of us were there. And so Margaret, Martha, um, and so it's important, I think, that we get out. And so we're looking at going to the next, the World Conference, um, which is happening. Uh, the Parliament of World Religions is happening um, August 14th to the 18th of 2023. So uh, we're going to be looking at all of us, uh, you know, many of us going to that, that as well and getting the message out. It is noon, so I think we're about out of time. But I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. Thank you again, Margaret, uh, for being our speaker. It was wonderful. Um, I love your book. Thank you all for your comments and your questions. Um, namaste. Have a great week. Thanks so much, Thanks everybody. Uh, Steve, no, no food from you? No yeah, breakfast? Yeah, no. <laughs> We're supposed to have blueberries today. What's going on here, Steve? <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to make sure that everybody had something to leave with besides the wonderful talk. Uh -huh. uh, if you're not into blueberries, I'm sorry. But I was feeling heavy this morning that I needed to bake and do all this with blueberries. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret. It means the world to have you on here. And PJ, thank you, honey, for all of your leadership in this and, and bringing these resources to us and to continue this, this gathering. I appreciate you all. Absolutely. Thank it's you. It's a real pleasure. You. Much love. See you next time. Bye. <laughs> I had an oral surgery this morning. So my, that's why my mouth looks like it does. And I, it took longer than they anticipated. So it always does. I, was, I was with you in spirit. I can tell you that <laughs> I'm grateful for all this. So I'll see you again soon. And I'm tracking you, Margaret, to get you to our conference, honey. I won't give up on that. Okay. We're all, thank we're you. All got that, uh, you know, we're lifting that up. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, PJ. Thank you.